Hey there, welcome to Impact Church Jacksonville's awesome video podcast. Get ready to dive deep into all things faith, community, and purpose with us. We're here to spark some real conversations, share inspiring stories, and maybe even challenge some perspectives along the way. Whether you've been a part of our community for ages or you're just curious about what we're all about, this podcast is your invitation to join in. So grab your coffee and let's explore together how love, hope, and service can truly make an impact in our lives. All right, you can be seated. All right, as I said, we told you last week to keep our eyes on the Middle East because God's going to wrap it up over there. But we also told you that Paul, writing to a young man by the name of Timothy, a young pastor named Timothy, he said this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He said, but know this. And we told you that that Greek word that is translated, know this, is a Greek word, gnosko, and it literally means in this context, mandatory information, something that you absolutely have to know. There's no way you can do without knowing this. It's kind of like that information I needed on that little job. I need to know when my break time was. <laughs> and if your neighbor's not laughing, tell them you must not have been here last week. <laughs> then gave yourself away. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Know this in the last days. We told you that phrase is eschatos himas, himeris rather. Eschatos himeris, it means the ultimate end, not just kind of close to the end, not, you know, almost kind of sort of the end, but the end of the end, the very end of days, the last. We said perilous times are going to come. The phrase perilous there is a Greek word kalepos. It means hurtful and emotionally hard to bear. Times are going to be hard to bear. What you hear on the news is going to be hard to wrestle with. The kind of stories that you hear happening around is going to be hard to, to grasp. It mean, it, this word is used to describe wild, vicious animals that are hard to tame. This word means harmful and filled with high risk. We are living in what the Bible describes as eschatos times, the end of the end of days. And these times, the Bible says, are kalepos. They're hard to bear. Paul goes on in, in chapter 3, the first few verses of chapter 3, of 2 Timothy to articulate 19 characteristics, or I could say this way, 19 signs. Again, if you're traveling to Orlando and you see the sign that says 20 more miles, you see another sign that says get ready for, for I-4, and you see another sign that tells you there are 19 signs that Paul points to in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that ought to be a reminder to us that when you see these signs, and the more you see these signs, you know you're getting even closer to your destination. So let's pick up at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He says, but know this, that in the last days, everybody shout last days. Last days. Come on, you didn't shout. Everybody shout last days. last days. In the last days, perilous times will come. How will we know that, God? Because men will be lovers of themselves. In the last days, eschatos times, folks are going to be in love with their money. In the last days, people are going to be boasters, always bragging about what they can do, what they have done. They're going to be full of pride, blasphemers. In the last days, kids are going to be disobedient to their parents. In the last days, we're going to have a, a, a whole culture and a climate that is unthankful. You know what it means to be unthankful? When you're unthankful, that means you're entitled. Folks do stuff for you. You think they should have did, done it for you. Unthankful in the last days. Unholy in the last days. Unloving in the last days. Watch this one. Unforgiving in the last days. So don't be shocked that there's some people, you can apologize to them. You can tell them, I didn't mean to do it that way. You can attempt to reconcile it and, and try to bridge the gap. And no matter what you do, the Bible says they'll be unforgiving. Nothing you can do to fix the, the problem. Folks will be slanderers in the last days, without self-control in the last days, flat out brutal in the last days, despisers of those that are good. That means they'll be mad at folks that are trying to do the right thing. I mean, anybody seen that? You know, folks, they, they, they liked when you was going to church, but you're still doing all the same stuff you did before you got saved. But now that you've actually are going to church and you've gotten serious about it, they get mad at you, despise those that are good. It says that folks in the last days are going to be traitors. That means there will be a lack of loyalty in the last days. Folks will be headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than or more than lovers of God. And then the last thing says having a form of godliness but denying its power. I want to spend some time today talking about that very first one that, that, that he mentions, which is lovers of themselves. And if you really were to translate that, what it really means is that in the last days, there's going to be a spirit of selfishness. This passage points out an overriding selfish spirit 
that will be characteristics in the end of days, the last of the last days. We live in a society today that is consumed. Everybody say consumed. consumed. Society today is consumed with self-interest, with self-promotion, with self-help, with self-love more than any other time in history. And can I just say this? That is a true statement inside and outside the church. You kind of expect that folks outside the church are going to be consumed with self. But how many know those of us that are in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit? That's eight of us that have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> those of us that are in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. Right? And because we have the Holy Spirit, we're supposed to be operating in the fruit, the, the production of the Spirit. Which means we operate not in selfishness, but in love. Come on, somebody. And in joy and in peace and in long suffering. Some of y'all quit a long time ago. <laughs> huh? And in kindness and in gentleness. In other words, those of us that are in Christ are supposed to have a mindset toward helping others. And not just become consumed with ourselves. I want to read an excerpt. Okay, I won't read the whole thing, but I want to read an excerpt from Fortune, an article from Fortune magazine. I want you to get this because this is not Christianity today. This is not some, some Christian document trying to kind of tie this into what the Bible says. But Fortune magazine, just recently, a few weeks ago, March the 12th, had an article talking about the very same topic, selfishness. And it's entitled, The Age of Selfishness, listen to this, is making us sick, single, and miserable. And they went on to say, it's because our brains are hardwired for both self-interest, but also altruism, which is serving somebody else. This is, this is a secular magazine <laughs> saying one of the reasons why so many people today are, are, are sick and single and miserable, and I won't just say single, but have bad relationships all over the place, is because we're not wired to just focus in on ourselves. God wired us, yes, to have self-preservation, make sure my, I'm, my interest is taken care of. But I also have to balance that off with having a desire to see somebody else's life blessed because I'm here on this planet. Amen. Listen to this article. We are living in an age of selfishness. Many of us noticed an increase in selfish behavior during the early days of the pandemic. At the time, we may have written it off as a flash in the pan that would subside, but it hasn't. From rudeness in grocery stores to doors closing in your face rather than being held open by a stranger... Behavior at macro level seems to have fundamentally changed. Even airline pilots are going viral for having to remind passengers not to be selfish and rude. Why is it that people seem to act so selfishly these days? Self-centeredness has been studied for centuries by philosophers, psychologists, and everyday observers of human behavior, with times of crisis known to predispose us to increased acts of selfishness. And we've experienced a period of permacrisis in recent years. In the case of COVID-19, it might have even changed some people's whole personalities. As younger adults became more prone to stress, distrust, and even neuroticism with declined agreeableness. Research shows that we are wired for altruistic behavior and get significant gains from it. There is a healthy tension between selfishness and pro-social behavior, that is, behavior that has a tendency toward generous behavior to other people. And it is critical to understanding today's social interactions and conflict in general. Indeed, people are hardwired for both self-interest and altruism, while a fight-or-flight response promotes looking out for oneself in life-saving circumstances. Our success as human beings depends on our evolved capacity to cooperate with other people. This means that there are natural constraints and limits to selfish behavior. Psychologists often define selfishness by drawing on evolutionary biology, economics, and philosophy. But in the simplest form, selfishness is focus on self over and above and even at the expense of other people. Presumably, this means that selfish individuals make competitive choices that result in greater personal gain, securing more resources for themselves to the detriment of the people around them. And while at its face, it sounds like there are big benefits to acting selfishly, there are costs that must be considered. While it might be a paradox, self-interested behavior has not shown empirical evidence of improving well-being. In other words, looking out for me, I'm just going to get mine. The evidence says that doesn't make you better, doesn't make you any happier. 
In fact, selfish motivation is correlated with poor psychological well-being, poor physical health, and poor relationships. For example, somebody caught in materialism is associated with negative self-appraisal, including self-doubt, as well as risky behaviors such as smoking and drinking alcohol. Impression management focus is associated with lower life satisfaction, as well as higher levels of envy, self-handicapping, and social anxiety. Meanwhile, self-image focus, you know, you got to have all your selfies all the time, you know, in every angle, and self-image focus predicts increased anxiety and depression. So next time you see somebody with a gazillion pictures of themselves from every angle, just know they're depressed. (laughs) Next time you see it, just go in there and say, I'm praying for you, baby. And health-damaging behaviors like a failure to seek medical treatment and substance abuse. It also predicts decreased relationship stability with increased relationship avoidance, anxiety, and even more interpersonal conflict. This is from a secular article, magazine, that recognizes self-centered behavior, selfish tendencies that the Bible says are going to permeate these last days will not benefit us. We will not be happier by spending all of our time on us. Now, let, me, let me sit on the other side of it, because there's some of you that will serve to you flat wear, wear yourself out. It is necessary to have some focus on yourself. What I'm saying is all the focus cannot be on self. And the focus on self cannot be at the expense of all the other people around me. Give me an amen, somebody. Amen. Give me a better amen, somebody. Amen. Now, th- this will help you out when you understand this. The originator of the selfish mindset is the devil. More, more, more specifically, Lucifer is the originator of the selfish mindset. Remember in, in Isaiah 14 when he went through his five I wills? The, the, the whole selfish mindset, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne ab- above the angels of God. I will be like the most high God. He was the first one that put all the attention on what I'm going to get out of this, what I'm going to do, how it's going to benefit me. And listen to this. The erosion... Of any good relationship, that is a friendship, a courtship, a marriage, a church relationship, uh, a neighbor relationship, the erosion of any good relationship begins with a selfish focus. You show me a relationship that's in trouble, I can tell you why. There's selfishness going on. You say, no, but you don't understand. You show me a relationship that's in trouble. Give me the details, and once you finish weeding through the details, I can tell you at the root of why this relationship is in trouble, there's some selfishness going on. Either this person is being selfish or that person is being selfish. Watch this. Most time it's both of them. Might not be 50-50. Might be 90-10. It might be 99-1. and one. <laughs> But anytime a relationship starts to go south or there starts to become problems, it's usually because there's some level of selfishness involved. Even when you see things like, like, like a single mom who ends up being more concerned about solving her own loneliness than her kids' emotional well-being. Your kids still struggle with the fact that you and their dad broke up and you and, you and their dad are not together anymore. You and already moved on dating somebody else and, and bringing them to your kids, introducing your kids to your mama's new friend. Don't get quiet on me now. And when asked what's going on, I, I got to be happy. Well, hang on a second. The kids didn't ask to be here. Come on, somebody. They didn't ask you all to break up and leave them in pain. Come on, somebody. And at some point, there's got to be some decisions made that, yes, I want to be happy, but maybe I have to put a pin in my happiness so that my happiness doesn't end up wrecking my kids' happiness. Give me an amen, somebody. Because we look up and wonder, why did that kid end up off track? Why did that kid end up doing this? Why did that kid end up on drugs? Why did that kid? Sometimes it's because mom and or dad took such a selfish approach that they didn't consider how their actions would affect their child. I need somebody to give me an amen. amen. How about spouses being more concerned about still hanging out with their single friends than actually investing in their marriage? I'm preaching better than you saying amen. amen. That's why some people say you're ready to be married, but are you really ready to be married? Maybe ready to have sex legally, but are you really ready to be married? Because ready to be married means, watch this, I'm ready to put nobody else on planet Earth ahead of my spouse. I mean, all of you boys that are still saying, my mama's my number one heart. Well, I, I promise you mama can't do you like your wife can do you. 
Well, I, I may say mama should not be doing you like. I didn't get enough amens on that one. Hmm? Hmm? Nobody comes ahead of your spouse. Come on, that's what the Bible says. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And it, I know it didn't, it didn't list everybody else in there, but the assumption is if I'm leaving the two people that are most important, that are most responsible for me being here, that means I'm not putting anybody else ahead of my spouse. Come on, that means that if my wife doesn't want me to go out with the fellas, I need to stay home and hang out with her. Say, but she's just a homebody. All she ever wants to do is be at home. You knew that when you were dating her. And either you convince her to go out with you some of the times, or you be willing to hang back and spend quality time with her because at the end of the day, hear me out, we cannot put our single friends ahead of our married partner. Amen. Tell your neighbor, that man is preaching up there. Amen. Come on, that man is preaching up there. <laughs> Parents being more concerned with solving their own unhappiness than considering the effects of their decisions on their kids. How about employers? Watch this. With no consideration for how their decisions affect the lives of their employees. Employees that just chase the bottom line, the mission, the vision. At all costs, we got to get this done, not considering how that affects the people that actually work there. I have, I have, a, I have a policy, I have a philosophy here. Anybody that works here for me, I want you to be happy. Amen. And, and my team will tell you, I work hard for the people that are part of our staff to be happy. Now, don't get me wrong, over the years, I can't make everybody happy. There's some people that no matter what you do, they're not going to be happy. But most reasonable people, they just want to come to a place where the, the, the leadership actually considers them in their decision making. It is selfish to chase profits and vision and not consider what kind of a work environment we create and leave people, watch this, miserable and stressed out because we won't make adjustments to care about the people with us. I need an amen in this place. I need an amen in this place. You can, even have, you can even have business partners that get selfish where we get so wrapped up in getting a profit that we forget about the whole purpose for why we started the business. Are you, are you with me? I'm trying to show you that you give me a relationship that's going south, and it's probably selfishness that's tied to it. And that's why the closer we get to the end of all time, you're going to see more and more relationship conflict. It's because there's more and more selfishness happening, even in church environments. Where you get churches that are just constantly asking, we need more money. We need you to give even more. We need you to give even more. We need you to double up. We need you to come with throw some money on the altar. We need you to give this. Yet the pastor is living an overwhelmingly lavish lifestyle. Now, I'm not saying a pastor shouldn't be able to live well because a, 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 I get a paycheck. Just like you get a paycheck. Don't get mad at me for doing what I want to do with my paycheck. <laughs> and if I budgeted well, come on, somebody. <laughs> If I, if I make good decisions along the way, I should live a good lifestyle. But I, I have on purpose made decisions. There are things I can afford to do that I probably just won't do. And it's because that's what folks expect the pastor to do. They expect the pastor to drive that, live like that. They expect the pastor to be flashy. And what ends up happening is you have people in the church that are struggling. And yet the, the church can become so selfish to forget about helping the people in the community. If you had any idea of the thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars we give to bless people outside of our church, why? Because the church wasn't put here to be self-centered and self-focused. I'm not standing on this stage for you to be impressed with the kind of watch I have on. It's a, what's this, I, I what? It's a Apple watch. That's what it is. It's, a, it's an Apple watch. I, knew it was, I thought it was an iWatch. <laughs> <laughs> I got an iPhone, iPad, plus was an iWatch. It's an Apple Watch. It's not impressive. Can I afford other watches? Actually, I've had more expensive watches. I actually got rid of them. Not because I don't deserve to have them, because I don't want to be like everybody else. I, I, I don't want that to be the reason why somebody says, I don't do that church thing. Why? Some, sometimes, sometimes we ought to be a little self-sacrificing. For the benefit of the other person that's watching on the other side. Amen. Come on, that's good, somebody. Amen. Listen to this. Listen to this quote. It's impossible to get consumed with self-focus when we're living our lives to be God-pleasing. Hmm? See, the enemy wasn't God-pleasing. Lucifer wasn't God-pleasing. That's why he could get self-focused. It's impossible to get self-focused when we are living our lives to be God-pleasing. 
That's why over in John chapter 4, Jesus was standing there at this well talking to this woman. His disciples had gone away. They come back, and they're trying to figure out why he's talking to this woman. And they, they say, well, we need to get him some food. He hadn't had any food. And Jesus said, I'm, I'm good. I don't need any food. And they start asking, did, did somebody bring him some food already? Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Come on, somebody. I'm waiting on you to get to today. Say, I don't need no fried chicken. I'm praying for God. <laughs> get them greens away from me. I mean, I'm ushering for God today. Come on, somebody. That's what Jesus said. My nourishment doesn't come from this food in front of me. My nourishment comes because I'm determined to do what God wants me to do. I mean, when you get so fired up for going after God's will that even food doesn't matter to you like it used to, that's when you know you're at the place where I'm not going to live a life that's selfish because my focus is on pleasing God. How about this? In John chapter 5, verse 30, he says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge like God tells me to judge. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Can't get selfish when I'm focused on God's will. How about John 6, 38? He said, for I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. I, I can read four or five more verses just like this, where Jesus is saying over and over, I didn't come down here to do my will. And if I didn't come to do my will, watch this, I'm not frustrated or self-focused trying to get ahead on you. Because I want to bless your life. I want to bless your life. I want to bless your life because I know if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else I need, God's going to take care of me. Come on, anybody know God's got you? <laughs> Come on, if you really know God's got you, I need you to give a shout like you know he's got me. Come on, I need you to shout like he's got me. See, I don't have to have me when I know God's got me. And why says, God can take care of me way better than I can take care of myself. So now I can spend my life, like Paul said, like a drink offering. Pour me out, man. Pour me upside down. Empty me out for somebody else's benefit. Use me up, God. Because I know, Lord, as I allow you to pour me out for somebody else's interest, then you're going to turn around and make sure you fill me back up with everything I have need of. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. Give me a better amen, somebody. Amen. I, I love the story over in Matthew chapter 14 where Jesus, his cousin John the Baptist, had just been killed. His head has been cut off in a brutal public execution. In fact, they embarrass him. They cut his head off, and then they bring it into this party and parade it around for Herod's entertainment. Folks go and tell Jesus what happened to his cousin. Now, I need you to understand, this is his cousin. You know how cousins are. Cousins are really your first best friends when this, happen, when this happens right. They were six months apart. So you know they had to be close. He just got word that his cousin, John the Baptist, was brutally executed in a humiliating fashion. And the human side of him wants to go, wants to go deal with the grief. Like the Bible says, he, he gets into a boat to try to go, go to the other side. He's trying to go to be alone so he can process what just happened to his cousin. As he's in this boat heading to the other side, there's a group of people that see him. And they're like, there's Jesus. There's, there's Jesus right there. And the Bible says they run to the other side to beat him to the other side of this lake because they want him to heal them. They want him to pray for them. They want him to bless them. They want him to touch them. But he's grieving. The natural reaction is, I, I, I'm off today, folks. I, I can't handle this today, people. <laughs> uh, the, the, natural, the natural reaction, everybody would have understood if Jesus said, I would love to, but today I'm dealing with my own issues. Do you know what happened when he got out the boat? He saw all these people. The Bible says he was moved with compassion. <laughs> let, me, let me translate. He saw their need being bigger than his need. Come on, man. How many times have you seen their need being bigger than your need? Versus my need is bigger than everything else. He was moved with compassion. He saw their need being bigger than his need. And the Bible said he told them all to sit down in rolls of five and ten. The Bible says he went and started healing them. Then he said they've been out here for a long time. They don't have any food. The miracle of him breaking those loaves, taking the fish, the miracle happened because he got over his own selfishness. He had healing and he had provision because he refused to be selfish. I wonder how many of us will get more healing and provision if we stop being so consumed with our own selves. Amen. John chapter 13, verse 12, it says, after washing their feet. There he's talking about is his 
12 disciples. Listen to what I said, his 12 disciples. This is not just 11. This is before Judas exits. He washes their feet. That doesn't make any sense to you unless you understand what foot washing was all about. It wasn't a religious ceremony that happens in church like it does sometimes today. Foot washing, what, was hap- what happened is hospitality. They didn't have paved roads back then. So you walked in sandals. You walked on dirty roads. One of the acts of hospitality is when your guests came into your house, they could take their shoes off, and you would have your servant bring a tub of water. And as an act of hospitality to your guests, your servant would wash the feet of all your guests. Imagine what happens when the disciples are all sitting around this table, and Jesus takes off his outer garment, puts a towel around him, brings a basin of water, and bends down to start washing their feet. Hang on a second. Your master washes the feet of Matthew. Washes the feet of John. He washes the feet of James. He washes the feet of Bartholomew. He goes to wash the feet of Peter. Peter's like, no, no, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. Jesus says, I've got to wash your feet or you won't have any part of me. Peter says, well, go ahead. Go ahead and wash my feet. Then he, then, wash, then he gets to Judas, who he knows is getting ready to betray him. And looking him out of eye, he still gets down and says, I know what you're about to do. But this love in my heart is bigger than the betrayal that you're getting ready to walk in. And I'm not going to walk in selfishness and think about how mad I ought to be at you. I'm not going to be selfish and sit here and allow my own emotions to get the best of me. I'm going to do what's right because it's right to do. And you're not about to stop me from doing the right thing because of the wrong you're getting ready to do. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again. And he sat down and asked him, do you understand what I just did? (laughs) You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's who I am. And since I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, watch this, you ought to watch each other's feet. You ought to serve each other. You ought to stop trying to see who can get to the front of the line. You ought to stop being concerned about, did I get mine or not? You ought to stop being upset because they didn't acknowledge me. He said, if I wash your feet, this is what you ought to do for each other. Watch verse 15. He says, I have given you, watch this, watch this, an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Then I love this verse 15, or verse 17 rather. He says, now that you know this truth, what truth? That serving is better than being served. Now that you know this truth, well, what truth, Jesus? That, that the way that you demonstrate that you're the top dog is that you figure out a way to serve everybody else. Now that you know this truth, watch this, how happy you will be if you actually put it into practice. Could it be the one reason why we got so many miserable Christians around? Because this end time spirit of selfishness has crept into the church? Could it be the reason why you got so many Christians that come to church, sing all these happy songs, but never happy outside of here? Could it be that we need to serve a little bit more? Could it be that you need to get plugged in on a dream team and let your life make a difference? Maybe just coming to church and hearing the messages is not enough to lift you out of that spot. Maybe getting up early and sacrificing so somebody else can get saved and somebody else's child can be a part of Relentless. And maybe that's the thing that helps to drive it. Listen to this. The greatest pathway to joy and peace is getting our minds on serving someone else instead of looking to be served. See, true happiness comes from serving other people, not being served. Can I just say this to married people? Because most married people don't get married for the right reasons. I'm not blaming you, but most times we don't get the right counseling, and most times we rush into it and we marry because we feel like we're in love. But real marriage, listen to this. Every married couple or married individual, would you listen to this? Marriage is a covenant commitment to serve one another for life, even if they never changed. Ooh. <laughs> Such a sound like ooh. That's why you don't just rush into it. You need to study that person. Can, can I serve you for the rest of my life? If you stay like this for the rest of my days, I'm hoping you get better, but I'm not going to marry you on, 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 on anticipation. If you stayed like this, could I serve? Could I, not, could I didn't say could I be with you? Could I put up with you? Can I serve you? Your small needs. Your little idiosyncrasies, could I serve you for the rest of my life if you never got any better? That's what marriage is about. It's a covenant commitment to serve each other. And I can tell you, man, the times in my life 
where I have been the most depressed, the most discouraged, is when I let myself get my eyes off of just serving. And I start thinking about how I didn't feel appreciated. And I start sitting around and I start thinking of all the stuff I do for everybody. And how they ought to be more appreciative than that. And what kind of life I provided for everybody. I don't feel like I hear enough or I don't get this enough. And every time I've gotten my attention on me, come on, man, help me out. Don't, don't leave me out here by myself. Every time I've gotten my attention on me and what I feel like I should get better out of this is when I've allowed myself to get discouraged and depressed and talk myself out of happiness. But every time I've allowed myself to be the Kool-Aid man, you know what it is, a big, that big Kool-Aid picture? Hey, Kool-Aid. <laughs> Just pour me out. <laughs> Just pour me out. Doesn't matter. Praying that everybody does for me and appreciates what I'm doing, but if they don't, there's a reward in heaven. That's all right. I'm good. God takes care of me. And I'm just going to let you pour me out and let God empty me out. Let God use my whole, use every ounce of me to bless somebody else. And in the process, I maintain my joy. See, the Bible says this in Job chapter 42, and I'm done. The Lord restored Job's losses. The King James says he turned Job's captivity. Or in other words, he fixed Job's problems. Watch this. When he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. What I want you to understand is this. God will turn our captivity around when we stop being self-focused and we become servant of all. We get our minds wrapped around serving, and God can turn it all around for us. Come and lift up your hands in this place and thank the Lord for the privilege of serving. Come on, lift your voice and thank the Lord for the privilege we have to serve him. Come on, lift your voice and help me worship the Lord in this place. Give me about two minutes. Help me worship God in this place. Come on, sing a little bit more now. Why are we
Father. Come on, say it like you mean it. Father, come on, everybody at home and in the building. Say, Father, I ask you now, search my heart, search my motives, search my actions, show me myself, show me where I have allowed the ways of the world and the signs of these last days to penetrate me. I refuse to live a selfish life. I refuse to let it be all about me. So Father, I'm asking you, asking Holy Spirit, point out to me my selfish ways, my selfish thoughts, my selfish tendencies, and I right now renounce every hidden work of darkness. I separate myself. I detach myself from every selfish thought and every selfish way. Let me love like you. Let me live like you. Let me have a concern for the needs of others as your hands, as your feet. I love you, Lord. I want to be like you, Lord. And I thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him a shout. Come on, give him a shout. Come on, give him a shout. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Please don't leave out just yet. We're not done just yet. Give me, give me a couple minutes. If you're in this place and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray for you. I didn't say you were a bad person. You could actually be one of the nicest people in the building, one of the nicest people in the room. You could be one of the nicest people watching this live stream from anywhere in the world. But being nice, being good is not enough for salvation. Being good is not going to get us into heaven. You say, what does it take for salvation? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't require you to promise all the stuff you'll never do again. Death doesn't require you to have some level of perfection. What it really requires is taking our lives and fully surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ. I mean, you got the right to command me. You got the right to be obeyed. You got the right to adjust my schedule, adjust my plan. And when we surrender our lives to him, he'll take us by the hand and teach us how to live this life as he changes us on the inside. So if you're willing to surrender your life to him and you believe that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. So if you're in this room, if you're online, and you're not saved, you're not certain you'd go to heaven if you breathe your last breath today, I want to pray for you. This is not a church. I want to invite you to the front. We're not going to embarrass you. I'm going to pray for you right there at your seat or right there online, wherever you happen to be. But if you're in this place and you say, yes, Pastor, I'm ready. I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to count to three in just a moment when I get to three. I want you to raise your hand as fast as you can, as high as you can, as your way of saying to God, I'm ready to surrender to you today. When I get to three, I want you to just shoot your hand up. The devil's going to tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't or wait till next time. But if you know something is tugging at your heart now, that's the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and say yes to him when I get to three. Here we go. One, two, three. Lift up that hand if that's you. Beautiful. Beautiful. If you're ready to surrender your life to him, lift up your hand all over the room. Thank you. See that hand there? Thank you. These young people right here. Beautiful. Beautiful. Come on. Who else? Come on, but raise your hand. Thank you. See your hand all the way there in the back. Raise your hand. You're saying, yes, I want Jesus. Yes, I'm ready to surrender to him. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody online? Anybody in the overflow room? I may not be in that room with you, but the Holy Spirit is. Go ahead and raise your hand right there. Be over there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if you raise your hand, I want you to whisper this prayer right there at your seat. Say, dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. He died for my sins. But you raised him from the dead, and he's alive right now. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I surrender my life to you for the rest of my days. And according to the Bible, I am born again. Amen. Come on, Impact Church. Put your hands together.